never worshipped a trinity. Jews worshipped one person alone, and that was the Father, which the Bible is very, very clear about. In alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, I'd like to greet you all with the Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I am the chair today, uh, Hamza Patterson. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending uh, this discussion as we're here uh, today at the big debates. Uh, also, I'd like to thank you for your patience um, due to some technica technicalities with uh, the PA system. Alhamdulillah, we finally managed to uh, get it up and running. So today's uh, discussion, brothers and sisters, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, respected elders, is who is Jesus? Now, Jesus, as we know, is a very influential figure in history and a figure that has had a discussion between many people amongst not only the Christians, but the Muslims, uh, humanists, secularists, and atheists. Uh, so who was Jesus? How did he live? Is a historical Jesus? Is the biblical narrative true? Does Islam paint the right picture? Well, today we're going to have a detailed discussion on who is Jesus by our fellow panelists, Brother Adnan Rashid and Sarah Snyder. Adnan Rashid is a historian with a speciality in the history of Islamic civilization comparative religion and hadith sciences, which are sayings, statements, and actions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He also takes a keen interest in Islamic numismatics, ancient manuscripts, and antiques. He has debated many high-profile figures in the field of politics, history, theology, and Christianity. He has defended his views success successfully in many prestigious universities, including the University of Warsaw, which is in Poland, and the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. Adnan has presented Islam and Muslims, represented Islam and Muslims, sorry, internationally, appearing on a number of radio and TV platforms. He is presently serving as a khatib at the West London Mosque, where he is presently conducting an intensive course on the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Adnan believes that Islam is a way of life which promotes modernity in all of its positive manifestations and provides practically realistic solutions for all problems facing mankind. Adnan Rashid currently is a senior researcher and lecturer for IERA, the Islamic Education and Research Academy, which is an organization dedicated to presenting Islam to the wider society. Sarah Snyder was a BBC television producer and journalist before returning to Cambridge University as a theologian specializing in Abrahamic religions. She works with the Cambridge Interfaith Program and tutors for the Wolf Institute for, Islamic, for Abrahamic Faiths and the Cambridge Muslim College. She is currently producing a multimedia series introducing Christianity to the non-Christian world, following on from understanding Islam, introducing Islam to non-Muslims. She is a Christian married with four children and she will be up uh, for, the, for the other side um, against uh, Brother Adnan. Now the format is that there will be two uh, presentations, as you could say, from either side for 20 uh, minutes. And then after that, there will be a 10 minute response on either side. Then we will take some Q&A from the audience and then we will close. I'm going to ask Adnan on my left to start the discussion. So without further ado, Brother Adnan Rashid.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كفر الذين قالوا إن الله هو المسيح ابن مريم وقال المسيح يا بني إسرائيل أعبد الله ربي وربكم إنه من يشرك بالله فقد حرم الله عليه الجنة ومأواه النار وما للظالمين من أنصار Respected brothers and sisters in Islam, dear friends and brothers and sisters in humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I thank you all for attending this interesting discussion between myself and Sarah Snyder or Schneider. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I am truly privileged to be um, on the same platform uh, with uh, someone like Sarah, who is an academic from uh, the, the, from the Cambridge University, and she is well versed in her field. And I really appreciate her attendance, especially um, when such a short notice was uh, was given to her. And it is a privilege to see her in hijab. <laughs> so today's topic is an interesting topic indeed. Who? was Jesus or who is Jesus? This is the question Muslims, Jews and the Christians have been asking for centuries. One of the bones of contention between the Muslims and the Christians and the Christians and the Jews is the personality of Jesus Christ. Who is he? What is his significance as a prophet of God, as a messenger of God, as a supreme agent of God or as God himself, as some of the Christians would assert. So his personality is central in the sense that once we clarify the picture of his reality, once we clarify who, really, who he really is, then all of these three faiths can come together on a common platform. The Jews have a perception of Jesus Christ. The Muslims have a perception based upon the Quran. And so have the Christians based upon the biblical text. And the Christians, they attempt to substantiate the divinity of Jesus Christ uh, from the Old Testament. And then they also use some of the verses to be found in the New Testament to support this notion of Jesus Christ being God in flesh with capital G. Today, my presentation will be based upon uh, the reality of the source material we have, uh, which actually tells us who Jesus Christ is. So how do we know who Jesus is? Did Jesus just appear all of a sudden on, on the planet Earth and, and we go, got to know him somehow without any uh, background information? No, Jesus is known to us uh, through many different sources. And those sources are what? The first source we refer to um, is the New Testament, which is what the Christians read as the word of God the inspired word of God. We, the Muslims, refer to primarily to, to the Quran. The Quran is what tells us what Jesus Christ really is or what he really was and what he preached and what was the nature of his message. And we as Muslims, because we believe Quran is the Quran is the word of God, we believe every single word to be found within the Quran, especially with regards to Jesus Christ. And the Christians also believe the same about the, the Bible, specifically the New Testament, because the New Testament actually talks about Jesus Christ and his ministry and his life and, in general terms, his biography. So, how do we know Jesus Christ? How do we get to know him? This is the question. How do we establish as to who he really was? Was he a prophet of God? Was he a messenger of God? Was he a God with small g? Or was he a God with capital G to be worshipped as part of the Trinity? What was he? Or was he a Messiah as the Muslims claim? Or was he a messenger of God as the Muslims claim? 
or was he someone who had a virgin birth? All of these things are very important. We must establish as to what the reality of these statements or these ideas is. So now we go to the first source material we have uh, with regards to the life of Jesus Christ. We know Jesus Christ primarily through the New Testament or by, from the teachings to be found in the New Testament. New Testament tells us who, who, who he was and how his ministry began. However, the problem with the New Testament is, is that it was written for religious purposes. It is seen as a supernatural text. It talks about his miracles. It talks about supernatural things. It talks about Jesus Christ feeding 5,000 people. It talks about him walking on the water. It talks about him being lifted by the devil and shown the world. It talks about him being God in flesh in not so many words, if, as the Christians see it in the Bible. I don't personally believe that the New Testament as it stands today uh, substantiate the doctrine of the divinity of Jesus Christ. It does not, in my humble opinion, as we will come to see in due course. So the first source material we have for the life of Jesus Christ is the New Testament. Can we take it at face value? This is the point I will be addressing. This is the first contention I will be addressing. The first contention is, can we take the New Testament, the first question is, can we take the, the text of the New Testament at face value? Can we accept it as the word of God? Can we accept it as the divine word, as a trustworthy testimony for the life of Jesus Christ? The second point I will be addressing today will be what the historians have to say about Jesus Christ. Because the historians are not concerned with the miracles and the supernatural acts attributed to Jesus Christ. What do they have to say? And then the third contention I will be addressing is that even if we accept the New Testament at face value, it does not substantiate the, the, the assertions Christians have attributed to Jesus Christ. And the fourth contention I will be addressing is the doctrine of the Quran seems appears to be accurate in the light of historical evidence we have uh, for the life of Jesus Christ. So we will begin. We have the New Testament to tell us who Jesus Christ is. And the Christians always refer to the New Testament as the word of God. When we study the New Testament and its collection, its canonization, and its authentication, we come to realize based upon scholarly works that the New Testament was changed many, many, many times. The first point is, who chose the New Testament for the Christians? How did the Christians come to realize that this is the word of God? These four gospels in particular, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the epistles of Paul, and then the epistle of Jude and, and James and all the rest. Who gave the Christians this particular canon? Who decided that the Christians will read these particular books as the word of God? When we study the history of new, the, the canonization of the New Testament and its collection, we come to realize that the, that the reality is far, far more complicated than the Christians would uh, want us to think. For example, the first time the four Gospels were mentioned together by any Christian author or any Christian writer or any Christian preacher in the history of Christianity was in the year 200 and the person who mentioned the four Gospels together as scripture was Irenaeus, one of the church fathers. Irenaeus was the first person to mention these four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as scripture for the Christians. We do not have any evidence prior to Irenaeus, anyone mentioning these four Gospels together. My point is together. The Gospels are, of course, written. The manuscripts were being circulated in the Christian world at the time. Many people were reading the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Matthew, Luke, and Mark, and the Gospel of Nicodemus, and the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of uh, Judas, and the list goes on. 200 documents were attributed to Jesus Christ and his life and his reality and his biography. And some were, some, were, some were known as Gospels. His words, his deeds, this is what he wanted people to do. One of them is the Gospel of Thomas. Gospel of Thomas is a very, very interesting um, document. It was found among the Nag Hammadi scriptures. Uh, and this particular library or collection of books was found in Egypt 
in the 1940s, late 1940s, uh, in Egypt somewhere buried in sand, and they found the Gospel of Thomas, its complete text, with these scriptures. And it has 114 sayings of Jesus Christ. Amazingly, this particular Gospel, the Muslims know what Hadith is, right? Put your hands up, those of you who know what Hadith is. Hadith is, yes, okay, thank you. Hadith is the word, the deed, and what Prophet confirmed uh, uh, as accurate, and this is what we know as Hadith. Hadith is the tradition of the Prophet ﷺ. Prophet Muhammad, what he said, what he did, and what he confirmed as accurate is Hadith. Okay. Likewise, Gospel of Thomas is a collection of Hadith of Jesus Christ. His sayings, his deeds, and what he confirmed to be accurate. So we have 114 of those sayings in this particular Gospel. Amazingly, and quite shockingly, we do not find any mention of crucifixion. We do not find anything about atonement. We do not find anything about the doctrine of the Trinity. Rather, to the contrary, what we find in the Gospel of Thomas is the denial of the divinity of Jesus Christ. For example, one of the sayings, it states that if one wants to see God, if one wants to see God, then find the one who wasn't born of a woman. So, in other words, the Gospel of Thomas is asserting that those who are born of woman can never be God. Jesus Christ was, of course, born of a woman, Mary. Then, Gospel of Thomas makes another interesting point, this particular Gospel. And amazingly, most authoritative scholars in the field of this particular gospel, those who studied this particular gospel and its, its origin, they believe that gospel of Tom, the gospel of Thomas is earlier than the synoptic gospels. The first gospel to have been written was the gospel of Mark some time around 60 CE, the year 60 CE. And the scholars who study the gospel of Thomas assert they believe that this particular gospel was written before the gospel of Mark some time around 50 CE. If that's the case, then it's earlier than the synoptic tradition. The tradition we find in the Gospel of Thomas is earlier. And it states that Jesus was asked as to who the disciples should go to when he disappears. Jesus Christ told the questioner that you must go to James. Peter is not to be found. Peter is not mentioned as the rock in the Gospel of Thomas. So you go to James. Once I disappear, you go to James. Who was James? James was a practicing Jew, worshipping in the temple, and was killed by the temple authorities due to his belief in Jesus Christ. And this is what we find in the earliest Christian histories. So, who chose these Gospels? Who canonized them for the Christians? We had 200 other documents. We are told by the leading authorities in the field of um, the canonization of the biblical text, one of them is Bruce Metzger. Have you, have, are you aware of him? I've not met him, but I know, I know of his work. Yes. Sure. Bruce Metzger is one of the leading authorities in this field. And he wrote a book specifically dealing with this very topic, the canon of the New Testament. And the book was published in 1987. And of course, the title was The Canon of the New Testament. And on the page number 251, he states, a basic prerequisite for canonicity was conformity to what was called the rule of faith. That is the congruity of a given document with the basic Christian tradition recognized as norm normative by the church. Just as under the Old Testament, the message of a prophet was to be tested not merely by the success of the predictions, but by the agreement of the substance of the prophecy with the fundamentals of Israel's religion. So also under the new covenant, it is clear that, the, that writings which came with any claim to be authoritative were judged by the nature of their content. So Bruce Metzger is telling us that the writings were judged based upon what the church believed in, not the other way around. In Islam, what do we have? Our doctrines, our creed must conform with the text. Not the other, other way around. The text shouldn't conform with our doctrines. For example, if a verse of the Quran goes against my doctrine, then I should change my doctrine and, and, and believe something which is in accordance with the verse of the Quran, not the other way around. What the Christians are doing in the early centuries, every time they received a document, 
uh, a gospel which uh, was attributed to Jesus Christ, they judged it against their doctrine. Okay, if it, it conformed with the doctrine of the church, established doctrine of the church, then it was accepted. Otherwise, it was rejected. It was not the word of God because it does not conform with what we believe in. It should have been other way around. It should have been um, the gospels and the documents which should have formed the doctrine, not the doctrine which uh, should have formed the gospels. So here, Bruce Metzger is clearly telling us the doctrine formed the gospels, not the other way around. So for this reason, and I don't blame the Christians for doing this, because there were so many documents, so many different um, writings attributed to Jesus Christ, saying so many different things. So the Christians were left with no other choice than to choose, to, to speculate and have some kind of system to, to fi figure out what may be the word of God. And it was purely the work of men. Men were the people who chose what may be the word of God and what may not be the word of God. Having established this, uh, that the canon was chosen by men and they decided what may be the word of God and what may not be, and God has nothing to do with it, then we go to the second point. Even if we accept that the gospel of, how much time has, uh, do I have? Another 10 minutes, okay, makes me feel good. Okay. Um, once we have established how the canon was chosen or how the books of the Bible were established to be the word of God, for the first two centuries, um, all different Christians were reading different documents. Even in the third century, all Christians were reading, reading different documents. Even in the fourth century, Christians were reading different documents attributed to Jesus Christ. And it was in the late fourth century when Emperor Theodosius, in the year 381 CE, uh, issued laws against those people who were reading any other documents uh, of course, except what the church um, authorized. So anything other than what church authorized was deemed to be heretical, and those people who were found uh, possessing these books, they were persecuted and prosecuted at the same time. So this is how the documents came to be known or to, came to be established as the word of God. But even if we accept that the documents we have today, the gospels, the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are from God and they were inspired and Jesus himself left statements behind that when I go away, when I disappear, please make sure that you read the gospel of John. Please do read the gospel of Luke. Please do read the epistles of Paul. Please definitely read the epistle of Jude. If, even if we had a statement like that from Jesus Christ, whereby he stated that these are the books you must read and reject the gospel of Nicodemus, reject the gospel of Thomas, reject the gospel of Mary, all of these things. Read these ones. Even if we had a statement like that, do we have the words of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John today? That's another question. Even if we accept that they were from God and they were written by those authors and they were also inspired, do we have what they wrote? This is the question now. We don't. We simply do not have what they wrote. And why do I say this? I say this because of what Bruce Metzger, again, is telling us. We have 5,700 manuscripts in the Greek language today of the New Testament. Almost 6,000 now due to the re recent research we, uh, scholars have conducted, and they have found some new manuscripts. We have almost 6,000 Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, and these are the oldest writings we have to support the text we read as the New Testament today. And the New Testament, which is there on the table, is based upon those manuscripts. There's nothing in that New Testament which is out of those manuscripts. So what do we have in front of us? What the scholars do, they put all of these 6,000 Greek manuscripts in front of them and they scrutinize them. Now amazingly, all of them, all of them are different in contents. They don't have the same contents. Every single verse in the New Testament is different from the other one in the other manuscript. For example, the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, which is a Christian source, states, it is safe to say that there is not one sentence in the New Testament in which the manuscript tradition is wholly uniform. This is a shock. 
This was a shock for me when I read it for the first time. When I read this statement for the first time, I was shocked that how can Christians claim that they have the word of God? They don't. And if all manuscripts are different in contents, contents, which one is for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Forget God for a second. Take God out of the picture. Which one is for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? That's the question. What did they write? Because Matthew wrote one gospel, one manuscript. So did John, so did Luke. And then later on, these manuscripts were copied and changes were made to them by scribes. Which one came from Matthew? We don't know. We will never know. We will never get to know that because all 6,000 manuscripts, the extant manuscripts we have, they're all different in contents. What does Bruce Metzger say? How was this New Testament then constructed? How do we get this? How do we know that this is from God or not? Bruce Metzger again tells us in his book, a textual commentary on the Greek New Testament, second edition, page number 11. He states, and please pay attention, of the approximately 5,000 Greek manuscripts of all or part of the New Testament that are known today, no two agree exactly in all particulars. Confronted by a mass of conflicting readings, editors must decide, editors must de decide which variants deserve to be included in the text and which should be re re relegated to the apparatus. Although at first it may seem to be a hopeless task amidst so many thousands of variant readings to sort out those that should be regarded as original, textual scholars have developed certain generally acknowledged criteria of evaluation. These con uh, considerations depend, it will be seen, upon probabilities. And sometimes the textual critics must weigh one set of prob prob probabilities against another. And the list goes on. And Bruce Metzger is giving all the details. For that, for the details, please consult the books. So, brothers and sisters, dear friends, Bruce Metzger is telling us it is the editors who decide what goes in the Bible. It is not Matthew, not Mark, not Luke, not John, not John. It is the editors who sit down and they put all the 6,000 manuscripts in front of them and they decide what may be the word of God. Not what is the word of God, what may be the word of God, because it is based upon probabilities. Probabilities do not give you certainty. So this is how the Bible is constructed, which is there in front of um, Sarah on the table. So having established that even if we accept that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were inspired and what they wrote was authorized by Jesus Christ and it may be from God, we simply do not have what they wrote. So the text of the New Testament cannot be taken at face value. We simply don't have a choice. I would love to accept the text of the New Testament. These are amazing documents uh, from ancient times. Absolutely. These are fascinating documents. Historically, theologically, there are many moral teachings to be found within the New Testament. But can we accept the New Testament at face value as uh, a historical or uh, an historical docu uh, authentic document? No, we cannot. We cannot. So once we have established that this document or the collection of documents known as the New Testament cannot be taken at face value, we move on to the church fathers, those who were closer to the time of Jesus Christ. What did they see Jesus as? How did they come to see Jesus? Some of the early church fathers, such as Justin, Justin was alive in the second century CE. And Justin, Justin was closer to the time of Jesus Christ than we are. And he read all of these scriptures. How did he understand them? How did he understand them? Justin, and now I've moved on to the second point I was going to address. So keep that in mind. The first point has been dealt with. The sources we have for Jesus Christ from the first century and the second century, are they trustworthy? I have already established, in my humble opinion, they're not trustworthy due to the changes which were made to them, and they were selectively chosen, and the rest of the documents were systema systema systemically destroyed uh, by the church in the later centuries. So once I have established that, I'm moving on to the second point. What does the history tell us? Those early church fathers, what they read, how did they understood what they read? Justin, writing in the second century, one of the church fathers, states, the Logos is God's offspring and child before all creatures God began. In the beginning, a rational power out of himself. So justice is talking about Jesus Christ as the word of God. And he believed that he was created. He was begotten 
Justin believed he was begotten, begotten. There was a beginning for Jesus Christ. And this is exactly what the Arians in the 4th century, they were arguing that if there is a beginning to Jesus Christ, then he simply cannot be God. Because God does not have a beginning. He is the first and he is the last. And if he is the first, then Jesus, if he was begotten, cannot be the first. So, we move on uh, to Origen. Origen was born in the 2nd century CE and was alive in the 3rd century CE. He was one of the ulama, the classical ulama of Christianity. You see, we have in Islam, we have scholars of Islam such as Imam Ahmad, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik al Shafi, Sufyan al Thawri, and Yahya bin Sa'id al Qattan, and the list goes on. We had these classical ulama explaining what Islam is and how do we understand our religion in the light of the prophetic tradition and the history and the, and the language of the time. They understood the, the Arabic language. Likewise, Origen, who was closer to the time of Jesus Christ, he understood how to understand the Greek language and the Greek tradition and the Jewish tradition at the time. Origen believed, he stated, we are not afraid to speak of it in one sense as two gods and in another sense a one god. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Okay? He was a subord uh, subord uh, subordinate. What's, what's the term? Subordinate. Yeah, subordinate. Yeah, that's right. He believed that Jesus Christ was a subordinate being to God Almighty. He was adopted. He was an adoption, uh, adoptionist. And he didn't believe that Jesus Christ was equal to God Almighty. He was adopted by God Almighty. So, Origen, writing in the 2nd and the 3rd century, is saying that God Almighty... Okay, give me just a few minutes to sum up, please. So, Origen was not a Trinitarian. He was not even a Binitarian. He was a Unitarian in the sense that he believed Jesus Christ was, a, was one of the supreme agents of God, but not God himself. He was created, he was made, and he was subordinate to God. He was adopted by God. And from Origen came Pamphilus. Pamphilus was a student of Origen who inherited the library of Origen. Origen was the most learned man in uh, the Christian world at the time. And Origen was persecuted. Then Pamphilus inherited his library. Pamphilus was also imprisoned because of being Christian. But these people were Unitarians. They were not Trinitarians. Now, Pamphilus, he gave his library to a man called Eusebius of Caesarea who was present in the Council of Nicaea, and he was also a Unitarian. And again, I don't want to go into too many technicalities. We can address those technicalities in the, uh, the Q&A and, of course, in our rebuttals. So the early church fathers did not believe, did not see Jesus Christ as God. And it is very difficult to prove that. It's very difficult to prove that, especially when we actually study the primary uh, sources in the language they were written in, i.e. Latin and Greek. Early church fathers did not believe, most of them did not believe that Jesus Christ was God. So what do the modern scholarship or the modern scholars have to say in this regard? James D.G. Dunn, who is in front of me, uh, he's one of the leading scholars and I'm uh, trying to sum up my presentation and I will talk about the Quran during my rebuttal or second presentation. James D.G. Dunn stated, that, and he's one of the leading authorities in the field of um, uh, first century, uh, the history of Christ Christianity in the first century. He is one of the leading authorities in patristic history, and he is well recognized by all scholars in the world. And he's still alive, and he recently wrote this book, uh, and, which is very, very interesting. I want you all to go. Uh, this is a suggestion uh, to go and read this book. Did the first Christians worship Jesus Christ? The New Testament Evidence, James Dunn. Uh, in another book, James Dunn stated, uh, the book is titled, Jesus Remembered, uh, on the page number 85, that in the closing decades of the 20th century, the most hopeful advance in life of Jesus' research um, the, was the recognition that the quest must primarily have in view Jesus the Jew and a clearer and firmer grasp of the consequences. What distinguishes this third quest of the historical Jesus is the conviction that any attempt to build up a historical picture of Jesus of Nazareth should and must begin from the fact that he was a first century Jew operating in a first century milieu. After all, when so much is historically uncertain, we can surely assume with confidence that Jesus was brought up 
as a religious Jew. James D.G. Dunn, page 85, Jesus Remembered. And also in the conclusion of this very book, he states, one is that, one is that there are some problems, even dangers in Christian worship, if it is defined too simply as worship of Jesus. For if what has emerged in this inquiry is taken seriously, it soon becomes evident that Christian worship can deteriorate into what may be called Jesus oletry. That is not simply into worship of Jesus, but into a worship that falls short of the worship due to the one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I use the term Jesus oletry as in an important sense parallel or even close to idolatry. As Israel's prophets pointed out on several occasions, the calamity of idolatry is that the idol is in effect taken to be the God to be worshipped. So the idol substitutes for, for the God, takes the place of God. The worship due to God is absorbed by the idol. The danger of Jesus' oratory is similar, that Jesus has been substituted for God. The worship due to God is absorbed by, um, by Jesus Christ. Jesus is absorbing the worship due to God alone. So this is what James D.G. Dunn, who is a Christian, he's not a Muslim, who is a Christian, this is what his conclusion is, having studied all the evidence, historical and theological, and all the gospels and all the documents attributed to Jesus Christ. This is exactly what his conclusion is. And he's not a Muslim. And this is what the conclusion of Jewish scholars, such as Giza Vermis, is that you cannot read about Jesus Christ without his first century Judaic context. You must read about Jesus and you must recognize him as a Jewish man, a Jew who was practicing the Jewish law in the first century. And once you do that, when you come to the Quran, this is exactly what the Quran tells you. The final statement. Ya, ya ayyuhalladheena, ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. The Quran tells us again and again, telling the Muslims that do not ascribe partners to God Almighty. Do not ascribe partners to God Almighty. And then ex this is exactly what the Quran asks the Christians and the Jews to do. So the Quran puts these words in the mouth of Jesus Christ. He apparently, allegedly uttered these words. And what did he say? Lakad kafar al ladina qalu, inna Allah hu al Masih ibn Maryam. Allah tells us, God Almighty tells us in the Quran that those who say that Jesus Christ is, is God Almighty are blasphemers. Are, are blasphemous. And what did Jesus say? وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحُ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلُ أُعْبُدُ اللَّهَ رَبِّي وَرَبَّكُمْ And the Messiah told the people of Israel, He told them, O people of Israel, worship one God, your Lord and my Lord. Thank you very much for listening. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Okay. Um, appreciate the first presentation by Brother Adnan. Um, he went over slightly um, to half an hour, so we'll give Sarah half an hour. Uh, for her presentation um, and then after there on we'll have to be a bit more tight with the time restrictions as uh, you know time permits we can't go on as we would like to but without further ado I'll give uh, Sarah the mic for her presentation. Thank you and uh, thank you for having me it's a privilege to be here um, may God bless the words of my mouth as I speak. Um, First of all, I want to just uh, say that I, I do want to speak today uh, primarily, or first and foremost, as a Christian um, rather than as an academic theologian. Uh, that's why I'm here, I believe. So I'm going to be sharing with you my understanding of Jesus from a Christian perspective. Oh, all right, okay. okay. Yep, that's fine. Um, one, one, is that better? No, no, that's fine. You can. One question uh, that I just do have in response um, to uh, my colleague's uh, presentation there, and one that actually I'm not going to address today, but I'll explain why, um, is, of course, the issue of uh, the Bible as a corrupt book, a corrupt scripture. Um, and, and a question that I've often had, and I've still not heard a good answer to, so I would love to ask this now before I forget, um, is why it is that God in the Quran talks about the previous scripture and encourages uh, the believers to talk with the people of the book uh, because that was given at a time much later uh, when the scripture was there. Certainly the Jewish scriptures were there as a full um, testament, if you like, and uh, the Christian scriptures were circulating too. So that's, that's a question I'd love to ask um, for later on. Meanwhile, um, I... 
Um, not here to prove Jesus' identity, because I believe, as all of you do, I'm sure only God can do that. Um, but I do want to encourage you to ask questions about him. Uh, what kind of prophet was he? What did he come to do? What did he ask of his followers? On whose authority did he teach? On whose authority did he perform miracles? How is the Injil mentioned in the Quran relevant? Can the four gospels about Jesus' life found in the Bible be trusted? And we've looked at that uh, a little. Does their portrayal of Jesus agree with the Quranic one? These are all uh, vital questions, but for today, I'm going to assume that the gospels in the Bible are a reliable source about Jesus. Uh, they have been accepted as such by the Christian community ever since they were written and assembled. Um, one thing that uh, Christians do believe is that the way in which the um, books of the New Testament were written and subsequently assembled by the uh, church leaders uh, was constantly in the, um, uh, under the guidance of God, that God, through his Holy Spirit, was guiding those decisions being made. So it's not simply that there were lots of books out there and only some of them ended up in the Bible. It's that God was continually guiding those people who were making those decisions. So that's a very strong Christian belief. Um, today's primary question is, who was Jesus? To many folks here in Britain, Jesus is just a swear word, but for both Christians and Muslims, he is clearly far more than that. Firstly, who was he not? Uh, he was not God's son in the physical sense of God having had sexual relations with Mary. Christians would be just as appalled at that idea as Muslims. Christians think of Jesus as the son of God, but not in the physical sense of a son, the word walad, perhaps, in Arabic. Instead, it's more the word ibn. It's referring to the relationship between God and Jesus. When God condemns the idea of him having sons or daughters in the Quran, I believe he's referring to pagan beliefs in which the gods often had children together. Likewise, elsewhere in the Quran, he confirms that he is not three, God, Jesus, and Mary. That was a common misunderstanding at the time of the prophet. The Byzantine church appeared to hold Mary in such high regard that she was almost, or possibly was, worshipped. God swiftly condemns such views. Christianity, like Judaism and Islam, affirms absolutely the idea of one God. The confusion arises over the three ways in which Christians understand the one God. Yet God is able to communicate himself physically within this world, as a book, for example, the Arabic Quran. So why not as a human being? If God can speak his word through the pages of a book, why not through the mouth of a man? Neither of these methods needs compromise God's oneness. He is and always will be one God. At the start of John's Gospel, written about 60 years after Jesus, he does not describe Jesus as created in Mary's womb at a particular moment in time. Instead, he describes Jesus as God's word, who has always been with God throughout all time and beyond. This is what he writes, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. That was written by John in his gospel. John does not think of Jesus, it seems, as a creature created by God. Rather, he describes him as the very word of God, i.e. as the revelation of God. Hence, when he becomes flesh, i.e. human, he continues to reveal the heart and mind of God. As a Christian, I believe that Jesus was a prophet in that he was sent by God with a message for humans. But I also believe he was more than a prophet. During the three years of his public ministry, Jesus' companions, his disciples, were also asking themselves all the time, who is he? Jesus' disciples were Jewish, and we've heard about the importance of understanding the Jewishness of Jesus, and I thoroughly um, agree with that. Uh, their understanding of God was actually similar to Muslim ideas about God, that God is absolutely one. In that sense, the disciples' views about God are very similar to some of the views that you will have here today. At first, therefore, they viewed Jesus primarily as a religious teacher, a rabbi. But as they spent time with him, hearing his teaching, witnessing his miracles, and learning from what he said about himself, they began to ask, who is he really? 
I'm going to look at a couple of the reasons for that. Jesus taught primarily about the kingdom of God, the day when God's rule will reign over all the earth. In preparation for this day, Jesus encouraged the people to repent of their sins and turn back to God. For example, in Mark's Gospel, one, uh, chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus' miracles particularly made the disciples wonder about his identity. For example, on Lake Galilee, in a wild storm, Jesus commanded the winds to stop, and they did. The disciples said, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Jesus miraculously fed a crowd of 5,000 when there was no food. That's a miracle also recorded in the Quran. He healed the blind, the deaf, and the lame, and he raised people from the dead. The Quran also refers to some of these miracles. And we ask, how can Jesus perform miracles? The Quran's answer in Surah 5, verse 110, is that it's by God's permission. Possibly the disciples would have thought something similar. They watched Jesus do things that only God the Creator can do. So they asked, how is this man related to God, creator of the universe? Jesus also forgave sins. For example, when he healed a paralyzed man. This man's friends were so convinced that Jesus could heal him that they made a hole in the roof of the crowded house where Jesus was teaching and passed him down. Jesus said to the man, son, your sins are forgiven. The Jewish leaders were shocked, of course, and thought, why does this man talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? No doubt the disciples too would have thought something similar. Jesus taught by his own authority, not by referencing traditional authorities like the great rabbis. So instead of saying, Rabbi so-and-so said, Jesus would often say, truly, I say to you. In fact, his well-known Sermon on the Mount, Jesus first quoted uh, Jewish scripture or traditions, he'd say, you have heard that such and such is said, and then he would say, but I say to you this. So on whose authority was Jesus teaching? Jesus claimed that one day he will judge the world. For example, in his parable of the sheep and the goats, he said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another. On what basis could Jesus ever act as judge on the final day? And if Jesus thought of himself as God, why did he never say so? The titles Jesus used for himself were all taken from the Jewish scriptures. His favorite, for example, was Son of Man. In some verses of the Jewish scripture, which is the Christian Old Testament, uh, this term emphasizes humanity. And Jesus would have been aware of this when he used the term. There is also a significant passage in the uh, Old Testament about the dream of a prophet named Daniel. And this is what it said. This is from the Jewish scriptures. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. That's God. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. That's from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. So this son of man is clearly a human being, and yet he was also accepted right into God's presence, given authority and power, and then worshipped by people of every nation. That would have seemed immensely strange to the Jews, and yet there it is in their scripture. Thanks. Jesus also described himself as God's son. He always spoke to and of God as his father and described himself as the son. For example, he told his disciples, all things have been committed to me by my, by my father. No one knows the son except the father, and no one knows the father except the son, and those to whom the son chooses to reveal him. The title, son of God, is actually a Jewish title from the Jewish scripture, in which it is often used to refer to the Jewish people, whom God calls Israel. For example, when God tells Moses what to say to Pharaoh, he says, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. Let my son go so that he may worship me. That's from Exodus 4. Another example is when God spoke through the prophet Hosea, saying, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Son of God is also a title in the Jewish scriptures for their king, who was chosen by God as his representative on earth. 
In the Psalms, for example, King David writes, I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today, I have become your father. In the Gospels, God also calls Jesus my son on two very important occasions. Both times, the language used is the same as that used in the Jewish scriptures to refer to King David. For example, when Jesus was baptized in the River Jordan, God's voice spoke from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love. And when Jesus met with God at the top of a mountain with his two closest disciples at the Transfiguration, God said again, this is my son whom I love. Jews would mostly have understood this phrase in the scriptural sense, as one specially chosen by God to be his representative on earth, a little like another King David. So just to sum up briefly, Jesus does things only God can do, like raising the dead and other miracles. Jesus claims to do things that in Jewish minds only God can do, for example, forgive sins and judge the world. Yet Jesus never says directly, I am God. Instead, he uses titles for himself that are all drawn from the Jewish scriptures. The disciples must have been confused. They knew Jesus was a human because they were living, sleeping, and eating with him 24 hours a day. But he seemed to be acting on behalf of God, and furthermore, seemed to have an intensely close relationship with God. So how did all this change the way the disciples thought of Jesus? When Jesus and his disciples were on Mount Hermon in Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked them, who do people say I am? The disciples replied, some say John the Baptist, a prophet, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. Then Jesus asked, what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Messiah. So what did Peter mean? The Quran also describes Jesus as the Messiah. For example, when the angel announces the birth of Jesus to Mary, O Mary, Allah bids you rejoice in a word from him whose name is the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. He shall be prominent in this world and the next and shall be near to God. That's Surah 3. But to understand its use in the Gospels, we first need to understand what the title Messiah or Christ meant to the Jews. In the Jewish scriptures, kings and priests were anointed with oil as a public sign that they were set apart for their special work. They were appointed and commissioned by God. In time, the Jews spoke about a hope that one day God himself would intervene in the history of his people by sending a Messiah who would be a descendant of King David. This Messiah would finally establish God's kingdom on earth. So when Peter called Jesus the Messiah, he would have had this concept in mind. He thought of Jesus as the descendant of David, chosen by God to establish his kingdom on earth. Why didn't Jesus ever call himself the Messiah or the Christ? Perhaps because the Jewish leaders of his time had developed a wrong understanding of Messiah as a political or a military leader, and Jesus' understanding of his own role was definitely not that. When Jesus was eventually arrested by the Jewish leaders and brought to trial before the chief priests, he was asked, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? And what did Jesus reply? I am, which by the way, it's a name God gives himself at the burning bush when Moses asks who he is. But at his trial, Jesus immediately continues by describing himself as the son of man in very similar terms to that dream of Daniel I described earlier. He was not claiming to be some kind of replacement God. He still affirmed the absolute oneness of the almighty God. So again, how did the disciples' understanding of Jesus change? When Jesus was crucified, the disciples were devastated and confused. How could God allow his appointed representative on earth to suffer such a shameful death? But then they saw the empty tomb and soon after met face to face with Jesus again, this time risen from the dead. They began to realize this was God's way of vindicating Jesus and affirming him as someone utterly unique. So take the disciple Thomas, for example. He was the one who most doubted that Jesus could be alive again after having seen the empty tomb. So what did Thomas say when Jesus stood before him and allowed him to touch the holes in his hands from where he'd been nailed to the cross? He said, my Lord and my God. So 
How did the disciples change in their thinking? Remember, their outlook is entirely Jewish. So perhaps they thought something like this. If Jesus is the one through whom God is establishing his kingdom on earth, Jesus must have the authority of a king, like King David, in order to be God's representative on earth. Jesus always referred to God as his father and spoke of himself as his son. He had an intimately close relationship with God. Jesus was able to calm storms, heal the sick, and raise people from the dead. These are miracles only God can do. Jesus forgave sins and claimed that one day he would judge the world, which made him somehow more than a prophet. Jesus was fully human, and yet he did things that only God can do. The disciples never rejected their belief in the oneness of God, and yet as eyewitnesses, they realized that Jesus had a very close connection with God. By the time the Gospels are written, within decades of Jesus returning to heaven, the disciples and the other early Christians have realized that God's oneness is not necessarily compromised by the idea that he is also physically present in this world. And that's really important, that his oneness is not compromised by the fact that he can be physically present in this world. Just seven weeks after Jesus came back from the dead, the disciples experienced the arrival of God's Holy Spirit to enable them to continue the ministry Jesus has begun. Uh, that was, is recorded in Acts chapter 2. They too were then able to perform miracles and teach in God's name. In some way then, God remains one and yet his spirit moves in the world. The disciples and the growing Christian community began to realize the close connection between God the Father, Jesus the Son, and God's Holy Spirit. All are one God and yet all function in differing ways. God's oneness is not compromised in any way. The greatest challenge to the early Christians came from Arius, or Arius, an Egyptian priest who taught that Jesus was not the eternal Son of God, but was actually created by God in Mary's womb. The church subsequently rejected very strongly this claim at their various councils, particularly the Council of Nicaea and, the, and at uh, Charles Sidon, but there are others um, too. This was when the church clarified the Christian view of Jesus as both fully human and fully di divine. By this point, the church was having to define itself within non-Jewish contexts, in particular in a world of pagans and Greek philosophy. Although some of the words developed by the church, like Trinity, for example, Trinitas in Latin, were not used by the disciples, they did not actually represent anything new, I believe. It was just that they were trying to formulate difficult concepts in, uh, in a different milieu. So Jesus, as son of God, refers not to his origin in Mary's womb, and certainly not to the product of a sexual union between God and Mary. Rather, it refers to the relationship Jesus had with his father. So I would actually encourage you to read a gospel to find out more about Jesus. Note how many times the Jewish scriptures are referenced. And remember all the time you read that Jesus moved in Jewish circles. His disciples and all those he interacted with had an orthodox understanding of God that was and is very similar to the Islamic view, firmly and squarely monotheistic. And yet they came to realize that Jesus was more than a prophet. John's gospel says, no one has ever seen God but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. In writing this, John shows that he believes God, the unseen, eternal, almighty God, has revealed himself and made himself known to us as Jesus. For me, as a Christian, Jesus is the clearest possible revelation of God we could ever have. A revelation not as a book, but as a human being like us. His character, his life, his death, and his resurrection all reveal the character of God and communicate to us how we should respond. So Jesus did not just bring a message like other prophets. He actually was the message. And what was this message? It's one that reconciles human beings with God. God will judge us one day, and Jesus came to show us how to be those who are saved, not those who are condemned. And then I'll end actually with something else that John wrote. Um, in his gospel that you will all have heard many times, uh, probably quoted at you by Christians, but it is relevant and very important in this context. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God sent the son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And that's from John chapter 3 verse 16. Um...
Um, hopefully, uh, the two presentations by Adnan and uh, Sarah have been informative. Uh, what we're going to do now is have a 10 minute response from each side, from Brother Adnan and from Sarah. And then we'll open it up to the panel where they can ask uh, any questions that they would like to. To, to, to the to the well, open panel, we'll say, as the audience, um, so they can ask any questions that they would like to. Um, but we'll uh, start with uh, Adnan uh, with 10 minutes response. Ten minutes uh, GMT or the Pakistani time? <laughs> Punctual, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for listening to Sarah and myself. Uh, I was quite fascinated by Sarah's presentation, although I've been exposed to that evidence many times uh, in the past. Uh, but I have already <laughs> given my reasons for not accepting that evidence uh, at face value, although it's, it's fascinating, it's beautiful, the, some of the teachings that Hebrew Jesus Christ in the New Testament are uh, amazing. But I cannot accept them in um, my um, mind because I am not fully content with the authenticity of the New Testament, which I have given, given reasons for. Sarah's question um, as to why we believe that the New Testament or the, or the Old Testament for that matter is corrupted or changed. I don't like to use the word corrupted because it seems very negative, but changed, it was changed. Um, and then the Quran tells us that go and speak to or ask the people of scripture in chapter 10 verse number 94 in the Quran. However, when we study the history of Islam, again, we go to the earliest authorities uh, um, in Islam we come to realize that they didn't actually understand that particular verse in this way. That there was a purpose, there was a reason why that verse was revealed in the first place because the Prophet of Islam was initially in doubt, in doubt in, in, doubt in the sense that when he received the revelation in the cave of Hera, he was shocked. This was a shock for him. An angel appeared to him all of a sudden and tells him, read, Iqra, Bismi Rabbi Kalladi Khalaq, read in the name of your Lord. And he says, Ma I am not learned, I cannot read. And then this particular incident or this event was shocking. He was traumatized, he was terrified. And he went to his wife and he asked her to cover him. So he was not too sure what's going on. And then God tells him that if you are in doubt about this revelation, if you think that this revelation is something new or something strange, go to the people of scripture, they will tell you about Moses, David, Solomon and Abraham and all these people received revelations before you. So it's not something new. So that's what the context of that particular verse is. Not that you go to the people of scripture to learn from them or take authority for them or take religion from them. It doesn't mean that. How do we know this? Because if we go to the book of Bukhari, chapter 9, book number 93, hadith number 614, 614, there is a report narrated by Ubaidullah bin Abdullah and he states Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu, the one of the cousins of the Prophet uh, who learned directly from the Prophet, he was a direct student of the Prophet Abdullah bin Abbas, he said oh the group of Muslims, how can you ask the people of scriptures about anything while your book which Allah has revealed to you to, to your prophet contains the most recent news from Allah and is pure and not distorted. Allah has told you that the people of the scriptures have changed some of Allah's books and distorted it and wrote something with their own hands and said, this is from Allah, so as to have uh, a minor gain for, for it. Won't the knowledge that has come to you stop you from asking them? No, by Allah, we have never seen a man from them asking you about the book of Al-Quran which has been revealed to you. So Abdullah bin Abbas who was a direct student of the Prophet ﷺ, who learned from the Prophet and he knew exactly what the verse of the Quran uh, means because he was a, a scholar in the field of interpreting the Quran. He was the top interpreter of the Quran uh, among the companions of the Prophet Muhammad. So he knew exactly what every single verse means and what uh, the context is. So he understood that particular verse in this way. Also. Uh, the verse he quotes from the Quran is to be found in chapter 2, verse 79, whereby Allah states, God Almighty states, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Fawailul Lilladina Yaktubun al Kitaba bi Aidihim, Thumma Yakuluna Hadha min Indilla, Li Yashtaruhu, Li Yashtaruhu bihi Thaman and Khalila, Li Yashtaruhu bihi Thaman and Khalila. Woe be unto those who write books with their own hands 
and say these are from God. So this is exactly what he quotes from the Quran. So this is what the understanding of the earliest generation uh, of the Muslims um, was with regards to the biblical text and the scripture, uh, the scripture of the, the Jews and the Christians. So the, that's how they saw it and that's how we see it today. We believe that the Bible does have some element of uh, truth, uh, truth in it and also it has the words of historians, the poets, and scribes and there were many changes made and it's that, that's not what I am saying that's what the scholars are saying the major authorities in the field having established that we move on to my basic contention although Sarah gave a lot of evidence from the Bible which I will address in due course very quickly um, I still believe I still believe that the Bible the biblical text cannot be taken at face value because it was chosen by people in the second and the third and the fourth century and it took the Christian centuries to even accept these books as canonical. I'll give you an example, e even as late as the 16th century, Martin Luther, Martin Luther, uh, the, one of the reformers in the 16th century, uh, did not accept some of the biblical books as canonical. For example, he believed Jude, the, the, uh, the epistle of Jude and James are dubious. He believed the book of Revelation um, is dubious. It should be thrown out of the Bible. He, and he also raised um, concerns about some other biblical uh, books. So as late as the 16th century, we have Christian scholars, authorities, doubting some of the books of, uh, which we find in the Bible today. So what about the early centuries? Early centuries were, were, much, were much more chaotic than what we found later on. The Christians simply could not make their minds up as to what they should read as the word of God because there were so many books attributed to Jesus Christ. So for this reason, those people who chose these four gospels and the epistles of Paul cannot be trusted because even if we trust them, um, I believe, I don't know what the Christian, I mean, you, 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 you're, you, are, you are an evangelical Christian, right? And you believe Catholics are, uh, are they've gone astray. No. You don't? No. Okay, what, what, what you, I mean, very quickly, uh, if you can tell me what... No, I simply believe uh, that uh, Catholics and, um, if you like, Protestants have slightly different understandings of... of scripture. Uh, scripture. And tradition. that they both um, are followers of, of uh, Jesus and... and sure, Jesus. but do you, do you appreciate their worship of Mary? Uh, no, I personally wouldn't. Okay, this, this, this is exactly what I'm, these are the points I'm making. The, the, exactly, Catholics have differences with, uh, with, with the Protestants and then um, again Protestants are divided into many different branches. What I'm saying is the people who collected these books for you to read as the word of God later on, they themselves had erroneous beliefs. Some of them, some of those beliefs you would reject today. You would not, because those people actually believed the Council of Chalcedon, you mentioned it. Uh, it was established in the Council of Chalcedon that Mary is the mother of God, Theotokos. That was one of the findings, and you would reject that, right? She is the mother of God, of course. I mean, I would reject the language they use. I understand right. the concept that they were trying sure. to describe. Yeah. So this is the point I'm making, that these people who were allegedly, or maybe some would put, at, uh, put, put them as heretics, are the ones who collected the Bible. So for that reason, we cannot take it at face value. But even if we do, Going back to the evidence you used, for example, the Gospel of John, uh, one one, used uh, you used a verse uh, whereby uh, Jesus Christ, uh, or sorry, John, John wrote that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God with God. And I want you to sh um, consider this. Paul and Anderson is um, is a leading scholar in the field. He actually wrote a book on the Gospel of John, the fourth gospel. The book is titled, The Fourth Gospel and the Quest for Jesus Christ in the year 2007. It's quite recent. On page number, um, this one second, I'm finding the right quote, making sure that I have the right quote. Okay. On page number 32 to 33, Paul and Anderson states, in accommodating these major perplexities, it may be inferred that a first edition of John was probably produced around or shortly after 80 CE. And this edition was produced to show that Jesus was the authentic Jewish Messiah. John 2031, of course. The preaching ministry of the evangelists continued. However, after his death, this material, John 1 to uh, John chapter 1, to, from, one, uh, from the verse number 1 to 18, and chapter 6, 
1517 and chapter 21 was added by the redactor. There was another redactor who came later on and this information was added later on into the Gospel of John. John himself, according to Paul Anderson, didn't actually write that. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God and the Word itself was God. So again, we can find Christian scholars going against um, some of these notions we can, we can substantiate from the, the New, Te New Testament. Coming back to how much? One minute. Sorry? One minute. One minute. OK. My summary. So what are we left with? If we cannot, if we cannot believe the biblical test, uh, text as, at face value, you cannot take it at face value, and the historians and the theologians and the most modern academics are telling us that only thing or only information we have on Jesus is or the only facts we can establish today are that he was a Jewish man living in the first century and he was a practicing Jew born to a Jewish family and he was taken to the temple and he worshipped in the temple. That's all we can establish for certain. That's all. From all the information we have, and who's saying so? People like James D.G. Dunn are saying this, and this person had studied, he, he has studied the, the biblical text and the, the information around it for 50 years. Someone like that is saying that we, all that we know about Jesus is this, that he was a Jew, and he was practicing Judaism. This is exactly what the Quran tells us, that he came to the Jews, and he preached a message of reformation to them, O people of Israel, worship one God, my Lord and your Lord, and do not follow your desires, do not change the scriptures, do not twist the law. All of these things, some of, the, some of this information we can find in the four Gospels, but the Quran is the text which we can substantiate through powerful evidence to be from God. And once we do that, we can see what Quran tells us about Jesus Christ is accurate. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Okay, uh, now uh, 10 minutes response from uh, Sarah. Thank you uh, very much, Adnan, for, for what you said. Um, difficult to know where to, to go in 10 minutes. The, the, the primary, um, I suppose the primary message I would want to get across is that there is a difference between academics of the Bible and between Christians who faithfully read their Bible as the word of God. Um, I couldn't read my Bible as the Word of God if I thought it was not the Word of God. Um, and so, for me, uh, spending a lot of time looking at which um, bits were edited in and out, which bits were excluded, which bits were included, and all of those decisions, I have to... Um, I have to say to myself, if God is sovereign, he was sovereign over the decisions that were made because this was a book that was written in the human realm. Uh, it, the, the Quran ultimately was written down in the human realm. It uh, was given by God to the prophet, but it was written down in the human realm. There are always going to be human influences and human errors involved in that process. Uh, so as a Christian believer, I trust that God uh, was sovereign over the decisions that were made, and therefore the scripture that we have here, the Bible, is actually God's word. Um, I take comfort, I have to say, in my reading of the Quran, um, because it refers so often to scripture, and I do believe it is referring to God's um, word in the same way that uh, uh, Muslims believe the Quran is God's word. And very often in the Quran, I read... Um, uh, God saying, tell them the story of, or tell them about, or remember when. And all of those are references to the Bible. Those are references to incidents from the Bible. And I find it really hard to believe that God would be pointing those people at that time and subsequently to a scripture that was changed from his word. So the bottom line for me has to be uh, that the Bible is true and trustworthy. Um, and every discussion I ever have between Islam and Christianity always ends up focusing on, can you trust the Bible? Uh, and I think probably we could go on for weeks and months and not come to a happy conclusion. We'll, we'll all know one day, but uh, that, that's my feeling for now. Um, uh, the other thing I was going to say was, and it, this book, it caught my eye. I think that churches who hold up banners that say, worship Jesus or Jesus is Lord, 
um, can often seem very misleading to uh, those who don't actually understand the thinking behind that. Um, so personally, I'm not in favor of those kind of banners outside churches. It does give the impression that Christians are worshiping another God, another God called Jesus. Um, and for the average passerby who doesn't understand the ways in which Christians understand God to have revealed himself as a human being, as Jesus, um, and therefore, it, uh, uh, therefore a banner like that can compromise the idea that, that God is one. And uh, I do want to reinforce that Christians the world over believe in one God. We don't believe in three gods, little gods. Um, and, and going back to your presentation, are we at 10? No, no, All right, yeah. Okay, oh, okay. Um, so going back to, to um, Adnan's presentation, I suppose my response to the first part, it really is that we have to agree to, to differ. Um, I respect fully where you're coming from, and as a historian, I'm not a historian, but as a historian, I can see how difficult it is to trust in a book like this as the Word of God. Um, I suspect if we really went into the historical um, uh, gatherings of the Quranic texts in various manuscripts, we would also find some anom anomalies. I haven't tried to do that. I'm sure some have um, in, in terms of the, of the writing of scripts and the copying process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I, I think we need to have our starting point and then move on from uh, the fact that you accept the Quran as the word of God. And actually, I also, having read the Quran, uh, would find it very hard to stand up and say the Quran is not the word of God. So a lot of my personal wrestling uh, with Islam is is looking at how how it, what what the Quran says and where it does seem to disagree with the Bible. How can I reconcile that with the fact that God is one God and that He gave, in my mind, He gave the Bible as scripture and uh, He gave the Quran as scripture. Um, and the second part of your presentation was on the um, historical sources. And uh, I can only say, you know, I've read all those sources and I agree um, with a lot of the, the uh, findings that you said. So. Thank you. So there you have it, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, those are the presentations from uh, either side. Now it's uh, your turn. Uh, to get involved, inshallah, uh, you can ask your questions to the panelists. Um, if what you can do is you can direct it, and what I'll do is I'll pose it as a question and direct it to the panelists who you would like it directed to. For the ones that would just like to ask the question, um, is there anyone now? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, can, I, can you hear me? I can hear you, don't worry, Howard. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's very exciting, and uh, I'm very much interested in this topic, and we can spend hours on this. A couple of very important things that you mentioned. One about uh, bringing up the dead, uh, one, of the, one of the healing qualities, or the various things that were mentioned about Jesus and Jesus morning. If you look at the Old Testament, there are other prophets who have done that, if you read carefully, it's there. What's much more important, much more fundamental, is the presentation of Jesus, the person, the human being, as something what he is not, because Quran brings him into perspective. Assume what we are talking about here is, if I had my remote control 100 years ago and I pressed the button, people would have said that was a miracle. But today, it's a normal event. When God brings out miracles, my understanding is that what was a miracle 2,000 years ago is no longer a miracle today. My doctor deals with lepers. And again, go to Harley Street, a woman who's not known men can have children. So this is the point I'm trying to make, because if you look at Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Mark, it's very clear how the genealogy of Jesus has been brought out. As you may, I'm sure as you all know, the expecting Messiah for the Jewish people, not Jewish, that's wrong, House of Israel, just because they hijacked the title from the Twelve and others is another matter. So the important thing here is the House of Israel was waiting for somebody from the line of David. They referred to Joseph from the line of David in Gospel of Matthew or Mark. Same again uh, in uh, the other Gospel, second one. And you go down and follow that. It comes to he was son of, he was son of, son of, son of Adam, who was son of God. So again, we grew another son of God. The point here is, how Islam deals with it is much more beautiful, in my view, 
this human, imagine God, who created the universe. Did he go and touch, manipulate? No. It happened. Forces, energy, yeah? So just, for the, just suspend this belief one minute and imagine Harley Street, one person's sperm, a woman's egg, appears in midair, merge, and goes back into the uterus. I'm going to have to ask you to ask your question, please. This is a clear case of, if you read the Gospel of Matthew and Mark, the genealogy of Jesus coming from the line of David, if it happened to be Joseph's sperm, how it merges with Mary through God's miracle, is quite possible because God doesn't need to touch these things or angels don't need to touch it. So that, you can legitimize the Messiah through that method. In other words, he was simply a human. This was the message that we need to pick up. And we can see the relationship here. There you are. The person with the correct claim for the line of David is there. That's what God, to me, that's what Gospel of Matthew and Mark say. I'd like to ask you what... So the question is really, from Joseph and Mary, how would you reconcile of Jesus being the Son of God? Of being a normal human being? So I think, uh, to, to sum that up, the question is, um, if Jesus is a human baby uh, born of Joseph and of Mary, even by miraculous means of Joseph and of Mary, um, how can we worship him? Is that the, is that the question? Um, so, yeah. So, so um, again, I would go back uh, to affirming the Christian belief that Jesus is not a human uh, baby as other human babies are, that he was born, um, he was, he was uh, well, he existed, first of all, with God before the world began. He was the word of God before time began. Um, and that at a moment in time, he did uh, enter this world through the womb of Mary and the spirit of God. Uh, but that, that that was God revealing himself in, um, in this world, if you like, revealing his word in this world in human form. Um, so Christians would, th in that sense, recognize the divinity of Jesus as well as the humanity of Jesus. And, it, and if Jesus is only human, then Christianity is finished. There's no Christianity. I, I'm going to have to stop you there, bro. I'm going to have to stop you there. I'm going to have to ask. Um, so yeah, uh, no thought to the brother before, but uh, I'd just like to remind people if you could just uh, keep your questions uh, precise, uh, you know, 10 seconds short, and then um, in regards to the response, uh, a minute maximum for the speaker to answer the question. Um, now we've ha had a question directed at uh, Sarah. Can we have a question directed at Adnan? Would like anyone to ad ask Adnan? A, a, a question? <coughs> yes. I understand you and others cannot accept the Bible as this value. Why not let others who believe in the Bible continue to believe in the Bible in their faith and belief? Okay, so the question is that uh, for the sake uh, of the audience. The question is that you don't be, um, believe that there's empirical evidence uh, to believe in the Bible, So, but why can you not let others uh, believe in the Bible and just let them believe? Sure. Thank you for that question. Um, I don't have any problem whatsoever with you believing in the Word of God uh, or Word of men as Word of God, which is the Bible. I don't have a problem with that. Muslims have historically defended Christians to believe in what they want to believe in or what they sh what we have examples from the Christ Islamic history where the Muslims allowed the Christians to live um, according to their own ways the Christians could farm pigs the Christians could uh, produce wine for themselves and the Christians lived as they like um, in Spain in the Ottoman world, we had so many historical examples. And the Quran actually tells us in chapter 2, verse number 256, that there is no compulsion in religion. So we will establish our case. And this, and my entire presentation was based upon the Quranic premise. The Quran tells us the Bible was changed. And the Quran doesn't even mention four gospels. Quran mentions one gospel. Quran uses the term Injil to refer to the book of Jesus Christ. And Injil is one gospel one book, one good news, okay? And when it refers to the books of uh, the Jews, it, it, it calls them 
the Torah, the five books, or Torah, the law of Moses. Torah simply in Hebrew language means the law. Okay, whether there were five books or ten books or six books, doesn't really matter. The Quran amazingly and shockingly uses terms which are comprehensive, which cannot be twisted in any other way. Injil, the gospel of Jesus, and the Torah, the law of Moses. It doesn't even mention the names of the books, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Leviticus, and all of that. It doesn't go into that. So Quran gives comprehensive formulas which are applicable in all times for all people and all places. Amazingly. So we don't have a problem with you worshipping Jesus Christ. If you want to do that, it's up to you. Our job is to clarify the picture, and if you want to do what you want to do, it's your choice. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay, can uh, we have another uh, question directed at uh, Sarah? Okay. So you, uh, so the question is that you don't um, see Jesus as a physical son of God. However, in another version of the Bible, the King James Version, it actually says begotten, which denotes um, of a sexual act. So could you clarify that? Uh, yes, thanks. I, I, th I think that'll be the translation that I um, used rather than, because I didn't use the King James Version. Uh, the word begotten, the, the word begotten isn't actually in the Greek. Uh, the, the understanding, um, if you like, that the, the use of the word begotten has actually come into our creeds and it's widely used by Christians. Begotten, not made uh, is the expression that Jesus was begotten, not made. Um, what that phrase is trying to clarify is that Jesus um, was uh, Jesus was not begotten um, in the sense of a man, a man and a woman, a human man and a human woman having a sexual uh, act and creating a, a child. That God um, planted, uh, if you like, God allowed His Holy Spirit to create that child um, within Mary's womb. So when it says in the creed, "begotten, not made," it's trying to untangle that word begotten that in our English language we understand as a, a physical act, if you like, um, and it's trying very strongly to clarify, to distance itself from that. I don't know if I've explained that very well, but um, I think that's probably a, lang a linguistic thing more than a, uh, anything else. It's a question directed to uh, Adnan. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, the discussion is very exciting, interesting, and as someone else said, it can go on forever. But, I mean, to pick up on two points, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Atnan, uh, something which usually is not spoken about in, uh, in a sort of uh, Islam and so on. The fact is, the scholarly fact is, that also the Quran was not written down during the Prophet's God. lifetime. And it was also the Quran, which is derivative, just like the Gospels, derivative of many other people's views and so on. And the only difference is that the Christians, for whatever reason, uh, have more democratic cynicism in approaching their creed than the Muslims, who are, of course, more faithful and more religious, and therefore more stick to the rules and accept it as a word of God. It wasn't even directly from uh, uh, the prophet himself, uh, 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 peace be upon him. I mean, in other words, uh, there is the same problem of derivation. Now, I mean, you can insist that uh, the Quran's language in later centuries was not messed about, but initially, surely, when they collected the prophet's sayings from uh, his disciples, from people who had directly heard him speak. Therefore, in that process, surely there was some corruption. And it is untrue to say that it is entirely uncorrupted. Okay. That's number one. Uh, and can I just can I just cruise through today because I have to. We are really short on time, so I'm just going to ask you just to basically sum up what is it that you want to say into a question. The question is that 
can there's a non... What do you think about this? You know, the okay. fact, this is a scholarly fact, right. and it is a historical fact never mentioned by uh, Islamic brothers and sisters. I'm trying to say why we Christians, I mean, here it is, it is interesting mm. that it is only us who represent the Christianity uh, section. I mean, it shows you how Christians are totally bored with uh, religious matters, <laughs> while the rest of you are very interestingly, immensely, nicely uh, religious. So, I mean, here, I don't know how many Christians there are here. So, in other words, this is number one. And number two, can I... I really do have to because I want. I need to be fair to everyone. You see, so if we do have time, I will get back to you. I do promise to you. I will get back to you. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So that's something that both can address. Um, Adnan. Um, yeah. The fact. The fact is, uh, you know, the the the, the, the that the Quran is changed. So how could you then still say that it's still the word of God? Um, and then I'll Thank ahead. you for that question. You, you mentioned very quickly, I'll try my best to answer this question as um, short as possible. You said that it's, a, it's an established scholarly fact. Can you give me one name of a scholar who said that the Quran was changed? One name, just one name. I've studied the scholars. I'll give you the names of the scholars who have actually studied the Quran in his text. Uh, and as a Muslim, I have to be consistent and I cannot have double standards. One standard for the Bible and another for the Quran. I have done exactly the same for the Quran, what I did for the Bible, um, for myself. I went to the scholarship and I studied uh, scholarship in order to establish whether the biblical text is authentic and also whether the Quranic text is authentic. When I did that, I came to realize, I mean, I'll give you references so that you can go and check. Um, there is a book published by the Cambridge University Press, Cambridge Companion to the Quran. Okay, and there is an article on the text of the Quran specifically dealing with the question you asked by a woman, a lady uh, called Angelica Newworth. She is a German non-Muslim scholar. She is a scholar in the field of the Quran and she stated that the Quran as it stands today is exactly what Muhammad transmitted to his companions, number one. Number two, Montgomery Bell, uh, sorry, Montgomery Watt and Richard Bell, two scholars in the 1970s, they wrote a book titled An Introduction to the Quran. On page number 53, they stated, the Quran we have today is essentially Uthmanic and that the, the job done by the companions of Muhammad in transmitting the text of the Quran uh, was amazing and the Quran we have today is what Muhammad gave to his companions. So these are Christian, I mean, Montgomery Watt and Bell were both Christians. I don't know what Angelica Newworth is. Uh, she may be an atheist or she may be a Christian. So scholarship, and another gentleman I met in person, Michael Marx, who is studying one of the biggest collections of the Quran manuscripts in Germany. I asked him this question in person. I took him on the side. I told him, forget the historical uh, correctness and political correctness, uh, put it on the side. Tell me what the honest truth is. The manuscripts you have in front of you, is there any, he goes, There's, there are no shocks. There are no surprises for anyone. He knows the Christians are always, I mean, not all Christians, of course, some Christians who are deeply interested in demonizing Islam, for example, people such as Robert Spencer, and there are, there are some crazy people running around in America, Pastor Terry Jones and people like that. They're always looking for things to find uh, some kind of information to, you know, demonize Islam or confuse people about Islam. But as far as scholarship is concerned, what you said is not, not correct. Also, Aramaic, uh, the Jewish people at the time, mostly living in Jerusalem, sp spoke Aramaic. They didn't speak Hebrew. So w what you said about Aramaic is not correct as well. The Jews, uh, predominantly, they were Aramaic-speaking people. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there, in his book. Sir, have you got any... Uh, no, I was points? just going to say about the Jews speaking Aramaic yeah, in Jerusalem. Yes. Okay. Fine. Um, now, we do have some questions that are written down. I'd like to uh, ask the, the questions, but the panel, you know, the audience do come first in regards to uh, spoken questions, so I'd have to uh, take from there. But yeah, you've had your hand up for a while, so. Uh, to say. Sir, like uh, you're saying Jesus is God. Okay. If Jesus is God, then who, um, who he were worshipping in the Bible, uh, saying that God is worshipping himself. Uh, would you say that God is all-powerful? Would you say that God is, has complete authority? Would you say that God is all-knowing? How can Jesus and God Which be one? Is it? I one? Okay, just one more. This is, how can, uh, uh, how can uh, Jesus and God be one? The same when the, they have different wills. Jesus, 
said, as I hear, I judge. And, and my judgment is not just because I seek not my own will, but the will of that Father. Okay? So the different wills, if they are one, he is contradicting. Okay. 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 So Jesus saying that uh, I am not going by my will, but I want to the Father. They're saying that, um, you know, that they're all one. So would you be able to reconcile with regards to that? Yeah. We'll ask, we'll ask that question. So uh, one question I would ask back, because I think it, it is part of this difficult, difficulty in understanding um, the human world and the supernatural world, um, is how are the words of the Arabic Quran, God's words, um, when God is, 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 is not in the Quran? You know, how, how does that happen? There is a separation that can happen of God that doesn't compromise God being one. It doesn't compromise his unity. Uh, so my uh, understanding of Jesus as uh, someone who is praying to his father, to Father God, is that uh, at that time Jesus was um, both human and divine. And in his humanity, he was having a conversation with God, with God. And, and that conversation was, if you like, going on within the Godhead. Um, there, weren't, there wasn't a splitting of God in order for Jesus to exist and be God. And I know that doesn't make scientific sense. That is a supernatural um, understanding of Jesus as God. But, uh, but the nearest equivalent I can find, I suppose, is, is this idea of the Arabic Quran and the Word of God. Um, thanks. Okay, uh, any uh, questions directed to Adnan? Yes. Okay. So the question is, what would you say to Christians who uh, believe that Jesus have died on the cross, where in fact you do not believe that Jesus died on the cross? It's not in the Islamic uh, belief. I think you're referring to chapter 4, verse number 158, where, where, where the verses state, um, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُمْ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُمْ He was not killed, he was not crucified, rather it, it, it was made to appear so. That's what you're referring to. So why were the Christians deceived? Well, the Christians were not deceived. Um, the people who were around at the time, uh, someone was crucified, and the story was spread by the Christians initially. Okay. Um, Paul is the person who made a big deal out of it, the atonement of Jesus Christ as, um, as a sacrifice for the sins of mankind. Okay? This is, it, was, it was made by Paul. This particular doctrine uh, of atonement was emphasized by Paul and he's the one who spread it. And he's the one who said that if there is no crucifixion um, and if there is no resurrection, then there is no Christianity. Okay? So... The central message, this is exactly what, when I debate some of the Christians or when I have discussions with Christians, uh, when I explain to them that the Bible cannot be trusted, they, they, they turn around and say, yeah, so what? If it cannot be trusted, but we have one central fact, and that fact is that Jesus was crucified and he died for our sins. That's all uh, we need to know, and that's, that's enough for us. But the Quran simply denies that fact. Simpli the Quran says he was not killed, he was not crucified, rather it appeared to people so. Okay, now the problem is if he was the Messiah, which the Christians and the Ju and and the early Jewish Christians accepted, because there were Jews who were Christians, in the sense that they believed in his prophecy, they believed in Jesus Christ, and they, they accepted him as a prophet, such as Abionites, people known as Abionites, they believed that Jesus Christ was a messenger of God, he was a prophet, and he was not God, he was born of uh, Mary, um, who was virgin. And there were other Abunites who didn't believe that, of course. Um, and they believed that Paul was an apostate from the law. Because Paul, in the book of Romans and in the book of 1 Timothy, he actually clearly says the law is no longer necessary for the Christians because Jesus Christ has paid for your sins. So these Jewish Christians, they believed in Jesus Christ. okay, But they did not make a big deal out of this atonement uh, issue. Likewise, the Gospel of Thomas, which is allegedly, or some, as some scholars assert, is earlier than the synoptic tradition. It doesn't mention uh, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It does not mention the crucifixion. So what do we do now with these documents? Do we... 
So amazingly, the four Gospels were written after the writings of Paul. Paul wrote his letters and there was a theology formed based upon Paul's, Paul's letters. He was writing to the Thessalonians, he's writing to the Corinthians, he's writing to the Romans, he's writing to the Hebrews, and the list goes on, okay? And a theology of Paul was around at the time, his theology was believed in. So now the gospel writers come later on, and Paul died in 60 CE, okay? And the first gospel, the gospel of Mark, was written in the year 60, uh, according to the scholarly opinion. Okay, so the Gospels are written after the epistles of Paul. So gospel, these particular Gospels were written to support Paul's doctrine. And the reason why they were accepted as the word of God by the church, because the church which was, which was examining them was Paulinian church. They already adopted Paul's doctrine. So anything which went against Paul's doctrine or the doctrine of atonement or the, the doctrine of crucifixion had to be rejected. Tom, the Gospel of Thomas for that reason was not canonical. It doesn't mention atonement, it doesn't mention crucifixion, throw it out. We don't need it. The Gospel of John mentions it, the Gospel of Mark, Matthew and Luke mentions it, accept them because they support what Paul said and this is what the church has come to believe in. So now this is what we will accept as the word of God and anything that goes against it, even though, it's from, even though it may be from Jesus Christ, it has to be rejected because it's not in conformity with the, the doctrine of the church as put by uh, Bruce Metzger. Bruce Metzger clearly stated that the gospels or the documents were accepted based upon the doctrine of the church, not the other way around. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, a question for Sarah. Yeah. Um, the majority of Adnan's talk, his presentation, was focused on biblical criticism. Early on in your talk, you sort of dismissed it slightly and said, look, let's agree to disagree on this, let's uh, assume that the Bible is accurate. And the majority of your presentation talked about your personal beliefs about what Jesus means to you and how he is important in your life, and, and I'm sure uh, uh, beliefs that are shared by many Christians as well. I think in this day and age, as rational, level-headed people, it's difficult for us to really believe that or accept that. I mean, how can you justify discounting all of the biblical criticism, considering its, its volume, its, uh, its depth over the many centuries, um, as saying, look, just believe that the Bible is okay, and, and you know, you'll believe and you'll understand what Jesus means. You know, as, as level-headed, rational people today, this is all we have to go off. You know, Jesus supposedly came 2,000 years ago. He's not here. We don't have his artifacts, his tomb, his bones, or anything like that, anything he wrote or said, and so on and so forth. We have, you know, scriptural evidence. So for us to decide whether it's true or not, just the same way we would do with Quran or with any other scripture, or with any book written about anything, really, we would base it against other evidence. We would test it. We would, uh, you know, try and justify whether it's accurate or not accurate. How do you justify discounting that completely and saying, look, just ignore all that and believe this is the concept of Jesus, this is how you should understand it? So the question is, how would you justify um, you know, discounting all of the evidence that uh, go against the authenticity of the Bible and belief in the Bible? Thank you. Um, I hope the presentation I gave wasn't simply uh, along what I believe, but was based on the source material um, that I, uh, as you rightly said, chose to uh, focus on, which was the gospel source material. Um, so to, to retrack, I... Um, I likewise am a rational thinker. I've um, been brought up in the West. I've, I'm still in an education system. I'm still teaching and I have to teach rationally. And I agree with you that it doesn't work in this day and age in the West to keep trying to, um, uh, to, to try and avoid rational uh, thinking and ra rational um, decisions. Uh, I do, however, think that we could spend hours and hours discussing um, the authenticity of the Bible as um, over the Quran. And uh, the, the topic of today is, is looking at Jesus. And I wanted to get away from spending a lot of time giving my reasons. I have my reasons. I've, uh, I'm not a Christian just out of a bubble. You know, I've thought it through. Uh, I've looked at the evidence. I've weighed up the Islamic evidence. I teach Quranic studies, so I've looked a lot at the Quran. Um, I, I suppose I chose not to start giving that kind of evidence, but to home right in on Jesus. Uh, and for, for me, um, the decision to home in on the biblical gospels, uh, rather than to say, uh, to begin talking about the gospel of Thomas or the gospel of Barnabas or all the other gospels that, 
that we're out there is because the consensus of the Christian community over throughout history um, has been to reject those uh, sources as unreliable sources. So I chose to home in on the ones that the majority Christian community have chosen as reliable. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question for uh, Brother Adnan. Is there a question for Adnan? Yes. Yeah, uh, so I'm uh, as a historian, um, how can you explain the, uh, the way that uh, the Prophet Muhammad had many miracles that he uh, conducted in front of his companions and uh, the fact that the companions did not worship Muhammad and they did not venerate him as much as the companions of Jesus venerated him and throughout the many decades afterwards he became a god or the son of god or he became divine in any way. How can you explain uh, the difference or the different approach which the companions had uh, from a historical uh, uh, angle? Okay, so from an historical account, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he did uh, other miracles as well as being sent with the Quran. Um, how can you compare that with the followers of nowadays Jesus where they've gone to worship? Thank you for the question. Historically, we know a lot more about Muhammad than we know about Jesus Christ. This, there is a consensus on this point among the historians. We do not know much about Jesus Christ. And the Gospels, for the reasons given uh, already, um, cannot be accepted at face value as historically authentic, trustworthy documents. This is why the historians, most historians do not accept the Gospel uh, record uh, as authentic and they just treat it as fiction or religious religious stories made up to to support a religion likewise uh, the quran cannot be accepted as far as the historians are concerned historians i'm talking about historians who are, who are looking at the quran as a historian not as a muslim okay they cannot accept the quran uh, at face value to not because it's not authentic they can establish that Quran the text as it stands today was definitely given by Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam there's no doubt about that okay whether the Quranic miracles for example Moses parting the sea uh, his staff becoming a big snake or things like Jesus Christ making um, uh, living birds out of clay um, things like these um, the historians cannot accept because they cannot establish the proof Okay, now the question comes back to the supernatural, the, the philosophy of miracles. Do miracles exist? Does the supernatural exist? This is where the question comes now. This is exactly where we are debating the atheists. Okay, atheists are naturalists. They are empiricists. You must show them empirical evidence for, for them to believe. And the debate we have against them is that the supernatural definitely exists. And if the supernatural exists, then the miracles also exist because the miracles are supernatural beyond the capacity or the producing capacity of man. So historically we know more about Muhammad than we know about Jesus and what we can establish about Jesus Christ is that he was a Jew and he lived in the first century CE and uh, historically historians are mostly agree uh, are, are in agreement that he was crucified. This is what the historians have to say. Of course, we as Muslims reject, I mean, a lot of the things in history are based upon the chronicles written at the time. So the person, for example, if we're reading about the Crusades and we're reading the chronicle of um, Falk of Charts or Gibe of Nogent or, or all these people who were writing about the Crusades, they, our view of Crusades is based upon what they wrote. They could have been lying. Okay, so the Quran is exactly telling us that, the, that Jesus was not crucified. He was not killed, he was not crucified. But the earlier sources, for example, the Gospels are telling us he was crucified. And then the, the writings of Tacitus, um, and then we have uh, the writings of Josephus. All of these writings are, of course, based upon what the Christians were telling these historians. The Romans and the Jewish author known as Josephus, he was told what he knows about Jesus Christ by the Christians. So they wrote, wrote it down. So the historians think that there is no other, we don't have a problem with accepting that he was crucified. But we have a problem with that because we believe the Quran is the word of God. And why do we believe that? That's another topic in itself. We can have another debate on that topic. So historically, we don't know much about Jesus Christ. And we will never know whether his, uh, his uh, disciples worshipped him. Even that point is well contested by this authority. James D.G. Dunn, he actually argues against that. He actually argues what does the word, word worship actually means in the first century Judaic context. 
Worship could mean paying respect, bowing to someone, paying respect, leaving your spot for someone else to sit down. Okay, this could mean worship in the first century Judaic context, which wouldn't mean worship, worshiping God Almighty, worshiping someone like you worship God Almighty. So there is, there are a lot of academic points which we simply cannot cover in such short uh, amount of time. I hope that answers your question. Okay, uh, question directed to uh, Sarah. Do you want to sit? Yes. So basically, um, sisters are just saying that there's a universal principle that something cannot be its opposite. So a dog cannot be a cat at the same time. So how can the creator be the creation at the same time? And how would you? How does that fit into your belief? Uh, that's a really good question. <laughs> Um, when I said that Jesus was fully human, I also said and fully divine. Um, so, so I was stating opposites in that case. I, I, I wouldn't leave it at just fully human, uh, because that would emphasize the humanity of Jesus more than I would be happy to do. Um, I also wouldn't, uh, wouldn't say fully divine and leave it at that, because that would ignore the humanity. Um, so we, we are faced with a very... Uh, difficult and mysterious question that says how can uh, how can Jesus have been two things which in our worlds are opposites um, and and I suppose I have to say I don't know uh, the answer to that I can't explain it if I could I'd probably convert everybody uh, you know um, uh, I I do though believe that Jesus that that when Jesus became human when he took on flesh of a human being he was still fully God um, I don't know how else to say it, but that's that is that, that is the case. Um, I wish there was another example that we we could have uh, that made it easier to understand, but I can't think of one off the top of my head. Um, but but uh, again, maybe going back to the the Quranic um, experience, when you hear the words of the Quran recited in Arabic, they they take on the word of God. They become the word of God, God's word. Uh, that doesn't mean that God's words are no longer with him. You know, once they've, they've hit your ears, if you like. Do, do you see, is, there's that, that's the only similarity I can say, that when Jesus took on, hu took, became human, took, beca you know, took flesh, or when God, rather, became human, um, and took on the shape of a, of a human being, he didn't stop being God. So there wasn't, a, a, there wasn't at all a case of the bottle being half full and half empty, half full God, half empty Jesus bit. Uh, it was that God remained fully God, but was able to reveal himself as a human being. Um, I, I do believe God reveals himself all the time to us in many different ways. Um, that leads into another very complicated discussion about revelation, so we shouldn't really go down that. But uh, I suppose I finish by saying I believe God can and did reveal himself as a human being and that that never compromised his oneness. Um. We only have really five minutes lot left, really, literally. So if you've got a question for Anand, then yes, you can ask. Yes, I'd like to get back to your question that you asked before when you were talking about atonement. 
So my question is, do you not believe that atonement is necessary? So okay. what is the Islamic view of atonement? If, if, we, if I understand you correctly, you're asking whether uh, our sins can be wiped away by someone's sacrifice or some, uh, another um, good deed. For example, I mean, we were told by the Prophet of Islam that if you do good deeds, they wipe away, you, uh, wipe away uh, your evil deeds. So, for example, if you follow um, 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 an evil deed, sorry, follow a good deed, <laughs> or you, if you do a good deed, do yeah, a that's right. Deed. If you do a bad deed and you follow it with a good deed, then your bad deed is simply wiped off, as long as it was a minor sin. Major sins are only forgiven by repentance. You must repent sincerely to God Almighty in order for you to be forgiven. And God is merciful. God tells us in the Quran that He is loving. Who will wudud? That He is most loving so he is the most forgiving being and he's the most uh, loving being okay he's not love himself so what what happens is if you commit sins all sins may be forgiven by god almighty all sins except polytheism except uh, shirk in Arabic, which actually means, in effect, ascribing partners to god almighty and this is exactly what jesus in the quran condemned that oh you believe um, oh the people of israel Anyone who ascribes partners with God Almighty will end up in hellfire, will go to hell because um, you are committing one of the major sins uh, in the sight of God. So for that reason, uh, Jesus Oletri, Jesus put, as put by James D.G. Dunn, is, it comes under that category. When you worship Jesus Christ and take God the Father out of the picture and the Holy Spirit is non-existent in the first place, uh, in that sense, every all the focus is on Jesus Christ, Jesus, 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 worship Jesus. That, in fact, turns in, turns into Jesus' oratory, which is what James D.G. Dunn condemns. Can I please just um, clarify sure. a small issue on this? Is that God Himself in the temple used to ask His worshippers to make atonement by slaughtering a lamb, and it had to be a fresh lamb, and it had to be the first lamb. Right. Well, um, one point of Christianity is that Christ, when he died, made atonement for mankind. Sure, I, I'm aware of that, yes. Okay, can I? Yeah. yeah. Very quickly, I can respond. Your, 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 your point is valid, and also your point is valid too, because the, 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 the biblical Jews, they used to offer atonements in this, in this way. But offering, but those, if you let me quickly answer, those atonements were for individual sins. Okay, those people who were actually sacrificing lambs, those atonements were, were for them. Okay, here we have an atonement where, whereby we have one man or one God, uh, if you want to see him as that God and man, he puts himself on the uh, himself on the cross and he pays for the sins of everyone, everyone. So all the murderers, all the rapists, and all the all the so, right. I'm afraid it can't really go back and forth. If you would like to have a discussion and a debate, it has to be somewhere else other than a platform. Okay, so uh, Adnan, your two-minute conclusion. Can you please uh, do it now? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to us and paying attention to our words and being patient. At the same time, I would like to thank Sarah for her valuable time. I really, really appreciate it from the depth of my heart. Uh, thanks for being here. Also, this question is a very important question. We should all go away and do some more research, read some necessary works, and look at uh, the subject in an academic way, and we will come to see uh, as to uh, what Jesus Christ was or, or who he was. And my contention was quite simple, that if we have the documents attributed to Jesus Christ coming from the first and the second and the third century and they cannot be taken at face value because there is so much confusion in them they are saying so many different things then we have to look at things uh, historically in a, as, uh, with an eye of histor an, a, a historian and once we do that we come to realize that all we establish is that he was a Jewish man, practiced Judaism, and he was a Unitarian in the sense that he believed uh, and worshipped the same God the Israelites were worshipping. How do we know this? In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29, a Jewish rabbi comes to him. Now, if Jesus was a Trinitarian, or if he himself was divine, then this was the best time for him to preach the doctrine of the Trinity or his own divinity. 
What did he say? The Jewish rabbi comes to him, asks, asks him, Master, what is the first commandment? And what did he say? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now this Jewish man has one person in his mind. He doesn't have a trinity in his mind. The Jews never, never worshipped a trinity. How do we know this? Again, in the Gospel of John, the same Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ, when he speaks to a Samaritan woman, a non-Jewish woman, in the chapter 4, verse 21 onwards, she, he tells her that, the, that salvation is of the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews because they worship the Father in spirit. Okay, that's fine. But who do the, who do the Jews worship? How many persons? How many persons? Three persons or one person if salvation is from them? So we go to the Gospel of John again, chapter 8, verse 54. Jew, uh, Jesus is speaking to a crowd of Jews and he tells them that I do not glorify myself, my Father glorifies me, of whom you say is your God. So the Jews are worshipping one person and that is the Father. So when that Jewish rabbi comes to Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, 29, asking him what is the first commandment and Jesus tells him, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Jewish man has one person and one God in his mind and that is the Father. And if that's the Father, what does the Jewish man say? He say, Master, you have spoken the truth. There is no one else. There is no one else beside him. And it's the Father who is one God. And what does Jesus say? He turns around and he says to him, you are close to the kingdom of God. You're not far. So if Jesus was a Trinitarian, if he was divine in any sense, if he was God, this was the best time to tell him, this Jewish man, that I am God, so is Holy Spirit, so is the Father. All three of us share one being, three different distinct persons. Now you worship us all. He didn't do that to that Jewish man. And that Jewish man was not a Christian, he was a Jewish scribe. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Okay, uh, now uh, your team at conclusion. <laughs> Thank you everyone for your patience and uh, for listening as well. Um, I suppose I, I'd like to conclude probably by picking up on this atonement theme. We need another debate, really, about the theme of atonement uh, to say that um, as a Christian, I do um, believe, along with many others, uh, that none, not one of us is good enough on our own merit to make it into heaven, that God will judge each one of us, that all of us sin, all of us make mistakes, um, and all of us turn our back on God at different points in our life. So I believe that a just God has to punish every one of us, or else he's not just. Um, and that's why I think Jesus needed to die on the cross, because the only way in which God could uh, punish us justly is actually by taking the punishment on himself. He, he couldn't put it on um, ourselves, or we would, none of us would ever be with him in heaven. Um, the only way he could get around that is to take that punishment on himself. And that's why it's also vital that Jesus is God at that point when he takes the sin on himself. Um, so he made that prayer at that point because uh, at that moment, God was unable to look on the weight of sin that he bore on himself at that cross. And that is why he disappeared for several days. Uh, and, and then when he was resurrected, he, he came back as um, a different, well, he came back as a pure man who was God. Um, no, no, we can't, we can't have it as a debate. I told you, we can't have it as a debate. So we do have to wrap it up. We do have one uh, minor presentation. Um, from uh, 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 <laughs> that's right. So just before you go, we'll just uh, finish up the presentation, and then um, which is about three minutes, and then we'll wrap it up. And okay. Well, let me introduce you quickly. Yes. You mind. Uh, we have our young brother, um, and uh, he has prepared a presentation for us uh, um, on the uh, Islamic view um, on Jesus Christ, and he will, inshallah, ta'ala present his presentation. And don't behave like me and go over your time. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Nahmadu wa nasalli ala rasooli al-kareem. Amma abad. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yisri li amri. Wa ahlu luqdatam min lasani yafqahu qawli. I welcome all of you with an Islamic greeting. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa my name is Yunus and I'm seven years old. Dear brothers and sisters, the topic today is about what is the position of Prophet Jesus, peace be on him, in Islam. 
Islam is only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Prophet Jesus, peace be on him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Prophet Jesus, peace be on him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that he <coughs> born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians do not believe. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he gave light to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and the lepers with God's permission. As Allah says in Surah Al-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 156 to 158. <laughs> Not my own will, 
with the will of my father, he's a Muslim. Jesus, peace be on him, was a Muslim. وَأَخْرُوا دَعْوَنَا عَنِ الْحَمْدِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالْمِينَ وَالسَّلَامَ عَلَيْكُ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ وَبِرْكَاتِهِ